Hello, my name is Buck Lewis and I'm in Memphis, Tennessee today, March 22nd, 2006, to interview Newton P. Allen. This interview is taking place as part of the Legal History Project of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. We're here to spend a delightful uh, afternoon with my father-in-law, Newton Allen. Proud to say my father-in-law. And why don't we begin, Newt, with you giving us your full name. My full name is Newton Perkins Allen. Now, is that Perkins the same as Perkins Avenue in Memphis, Tennessee? Exactly. And what's the relationship there? Well, my grandfather on my mother's side, she was a Perkins. And Newton Cannon Perkins was her father. He was the commissioner of the uh, courthouse. And he was in charge of the commission that built the courthouse. Where were you born? I was born right here in Memphis. When were you born? January 3, 1922. And were you born in a hospital? Or were you born at home? No, or? I was born right in the Baptist Hospital, the old part. Baptist Hospital on Union that they blew up not too long ago. Well, that's right. I think, I think the old part, I don't think the old part exists either. But the new part was blown up just recently. But that didn't have anything to do with you being born there, I hope. I think, uh, <laughs> I think my influence was bad. And as a result, they figured, well, let's blow it up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Now, tell us the name of your parents. My parents were said, James said, and Allen. My mother was uh, Sarah Perkins Allen, and what, uh, they were great parents. What about your grandparents? Well, my father's uh, parents were Richard H. Allen and Lizzie Allen. Uh, as I said before, just a minute ago, uh, my mother's parents were, were Newton Perkins and his wife. Was Mr. Perkins uh, a prominent landowner? Oh, very much. He owned lots of land and one parcel of land out beyond the expressway. I handled several cases <clears throat> because the land had been uh, dug out for excavations and then filled back in. But they were filled back in improperly. And the houses built on them gradually sank. So did the name Perkins Street or Perkins Avenue come from him? Exactly. And is that land still in the family? Oh, no. His home was on uh, Poplar Avenue right next to where the uh, uh, Methodist Church is on Poplar. It was sold, oh, probably 15, 20, 25 years ago. It's completely uh, bare now and is used for soccer games for the kids at uh, United Methodist. You had how many brothers? I had three brothers. My oldest brother was Seddon Allen. My, I was second. My uh, younger brother, the first younger brother, was Richard H. Allen, who we called Dick. He was a lawyer. And my third brother was uh, Robert Goodwin Allen, and we called him Bobby. And he was a heart surgeon. He was the first uh, heart surgeon to successfully uh, do a heart surgery in Memphis. He learned it up in Boston after the war. He was also the first uh, <clears throat> surgeon to do a heart catheterization on an infant, was he not? Probably so. His specialty was for infants. Lots and lots of uh, kids had uh, been through his operations. And some of the operations still bear his name. He was a smart guy. And your and father, a nice guy. your father was a lawyer. 
He was. And was he one of the founding partners of the firm that we know in 2006 as the Armstrong Allen firm? That's right. He and Walt Armstrong Sr. and Ed McCadden. And they all came from three different uh, practices in 1932. And uh, they formed the, uh, the firm, which is now Armstrong Allen. When I joined the firm after I graduated from UVA in 1948, there were probably about five people in it. And your brother Dick was in the firm as well. That's right. He graduated from uh, the University of Florida at Gainesville. He took uh, undergraduate and law at the same time in about three or four years on an accelerated basis after the war was over. And we remember that Walter Armstrong, Jr. of that firm was president of the American Bar Association. You know, I don't believe that he was president. All right. Walter Armstrong Sr. was. Okay. But I don't think his son was ever president of the ABA. Maybe he, he tried ran, to he course, tried so he very ran hard. For ABA president and never huh? quite made it. He tried very hard to to be that president and should have been. But was not. I I'm think. I think the Tennessee Bar Foundation brings us here today, and your brother Dick was very active in the Tennessee Bar Association. That's true, very active, and in the Memphis Bar, and also in the ABA. And was Dick president of the Tennessee Bar Association? He was. Do you remember what year? I can't remember, but during his presidency of the uh, of the Memphis Bar, the courthouse, the, the uh, the courtrooms in the courthouse were begun to be renovated. And I think three of them were completed in their renovation while he was president. They were, the difference was between night and day. When I started practicing, there was no air conditioning. The courtrooms were drab. You could even take your coat off. It was so hot. Uh, anyway, Dick did a great job. Your former law partner, Tom Pruitt, has been quoted as saying that the reason that people went to the Tennessee Bar Association conventions was because they were always at a nice hotel where they had air conditioning. <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true because when I started in 48, air conditioning in the South was just coming in. We had a couple of units in the office, but uh, they didn't work very well. But it was a lot better uh, than not having them. There's a famous old steam plant in Memphis called the Allen Steam Plant. Is that part of the same family? Yes, that was my Uncle Tom, Thomas H. Allen, Thomas Hampton Allen. And he was president of the, uh, the Memphis Light, Gas, and Water from its very inception. As a matter of fact, he and my dad were brothers. And my dad represented the uh, private company, which was part of Abasco. That was the uh, private company that ran the light, gas, and water. My Uncle Tom was slated to be the president of the public company. So they were in loggerheads. And of course, that didn't make any difference in their friendship. They were always great friends, great people. And he was an engineer by education? He was indeed. And as a matter of fact, uh, I think you have some relatives up in uh, Tennessee. Uh, and I think that uh, my Uncle Tom had some kind of a uh, connection with some sort of uh, utility in the same city. My grandfather, the original George Lewis, was involved with the Bell's Light and Water Company, and I think that's what you're I think that's referring. probably the one. You, you grew up in Memphis, and mm. where part of Memphis did you live in? We lived at 2231 South Parkway East. It's now a big Baptist church. It's it really? Was, it, was very, it was very close to the fairgrounds, right down the street. 
fairgrounds was entirely different. They even had a racetrack for horses because horse racing was legal before it was outlawed uh, by the legislature. But it was very close to where it turns and goes uh, north on, uh, to Overton Park. I know that one of the important things in your life as a young man was scouting. Tell us about that. Well, it really was. It was one of the great, it was probably the greatest influence on me while I was growing up, besides my family. It was Troop 34. When I got into Troop 34, there were probably seven or eight people, uh, Boy Scouts, in it. As a matter of fact, there was a lawyer whose name I forget, who was the scoutmaster, but he quit. And then uh, about a year later, Alvin Tate came in to be the scoutmaster. George Phillips was his assistant. Bill Holliday, who worked at the Peabody Hotel, was also an assistant scoutmaster and provided all of our food when we went down to Camp Correa, so we didn't <laughs> we didn't have to rough it very much mm -hmm. <laughs> with Bill Halliday on board. But it was marvelous. We had a great troop, and we won everything. It was all competitive. Mm -hmm. We'd go to the jamboree down in uh, uh, Mississippi, and uh, and we won so many times that they finally they finally decided. Uh, to make it non-competitive. Uh, so, uh, but it was great. Because the other troops were getting discouraged? Well, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still friends? Of course, friend? I'm highly prejudiced. <laughs> Are you still friends today with some of those, uh, some of those uh, troop, scout troop members? Well, of course, Alvin Tate's died, and George Phillips, unfortunately, has died, Bill Halliday. Uh, my two cousins, Billy and John Phillips, they were scouts at the same time I was. Billy was about the same age as I was, three months older. John was his younger brother. Uh, Bob Rock was in the troop. Johnny Hurd, who was killed in the war over France uh, while he was flying over a bombing mission. Uh, he was part of the troop, and some of the other people. Uh, I haven't kept up with the rest of them, but I'm afraid most of them have died. Did your father talk at the dinner table about law and politics and his cases? No, he really didn't. He really didn't. Uh, he and Bill Kaiser, Bill Kaiser lived next door to him. They bought they, they built houses right next door to each other. They were great friends. Uh, Bill Kaiser and uh, my dad, and then Senator McKellar was also a part of their uh, firm. And then McKellar became a, a senator, so he had to withdraw, went to Washington, and was there for years and years. He was finally beat by Keith Alford. Uh, He's the, the U.S. Senator that McKellar Park is named after. Exactly. Okay. So your dad just didn't like talking shop back at, back home? Well, I don't know. He, he, he didn't. And I never heard anything about his cases except the case about the Memphis Light, Gas, and Water. Mm -hmm. um, and he never talked about his community activities, which were many. Uh, it was more of a family. Uh, everything was family. And we'd eat dinner on Sunday lunch, not really lunch, it was dinner at noon. Uh, it was great. All of us there together. It was a great, I, had a, I was blessed with a great growing up. What types of community activities were your mother and father involved in? Well, uh, Dad uh, was president of the Rotary Club. He was president of the uh, USO during the war. 
he was active in the uh, bar associations, especially Tennessee and Memphis. Uh, my mother headed up a guild at the Calvary Episcopal Church. That's where I grew up. And she was very active uh, in church work. She was also, I think, the chairwoman of the women of the church, which was the Episcopal women <coughs> throughout the state. <coughs> Excuse me. The Calvary Episcopal Church is a historic old church that sits right next to the Shelby County Courthouse between 2nd and 3rd, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. And do you still attend that church? I do. Have you been attending Calvary your whole life? No. I grew up there, and, uh, and my Uncle Tom taught a Sunday school class there, the one who's, whose name is down in the, uh, the uh, generation uh, center. He taught a Sunday school class. And I remember once he said, everybody sit perfectly still. And then he said, uh, you can come up here and stand right beside me. I said, are you standing perfectly still? I said, yes. Yes, sir. He said, no, you're not. You're going around the sun <laughs> at so many thousand miles an hour, you're not standing still. You're going around the sun, and uh, I don't know what part of the Sunday school class that had to do with, but <laughs> I've never forgotten it. <laughs> you, you remember the sun story, but you don't remember the Bible verse. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> I know that some of your fondest uh, childhood memories involve travel with your dad. Tell us about some of those wonderful trips. Well... The earliest trip that I have any recollection about, I was three years old. And it's the only thing I remember about being three years old. We went to Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. And all I remember is that I dug out uh, in the sand a sort of a bowl. And the waves would come up and fill up the bowl. And I'd sit in that bowl while the water came up and then drained away. My only memory. Then later on, when I was a teenager, the best trip we had was out west. We went out west and spent a couple of weeks, maybe three, but three weeks was all my dad was able to be out of the office. Uh, we went to Grand Canyon uh, Salt Lake City swam in the uh, Salt Lake, which I don't think you can do anymore. I went to Zion, Bryce. Zion National Park? Zion National Park and Bryce. Bryce Canyon. Canyon. And we rode horses in both of those areas. And I think we, we probably rode horses at the Grand Canyon, but we didn't go down to the bottom. Uh, it was a great trip. Did all of your brothers go with you? All of us. And your mother? And mother. You talk about your dad not being able to be out of the office more than two or three weeks. Back then, did he take a telegram to try to deal with things back at the office? Or? No. When he was out of the office, he was out of the office. So he but understood what so many lawyers today don't understand, is that they need to take a vacation from communications. You're right. Okay. You're right. But he was antsy to get back. He was awful busy. He was a good lawyer, had lots of clients, and he just couldn't stay out of the office. Say. I think three weeks was his absolute limit. Did you work during the summer or anything associated with law, or did you, did you even know before you went to college that you, if you were interested in law? Well, I sort of thought I might be. Of course, Dad's library had all the Tennessee reports, the Tennessee appellate decisions, uh, U.S. Uh, reports, all of it. I never once looked in any of those books. <laughs> never. <laughs> Did you just think they looked dignified? <laughs> well, I just didn't, I didn't fool with it. I was interested in other things. I wasn't interested in going to law school. 
I was in the Boy Scouts, Phi Kappa fraternity, which are now outlawed in high school. That was another good influence. The fraternity? Yeah. And why do you say that? Well, we'd meet every Sunday down in the Falls building, which is still down on Front Street. <clears throat> Excuse me. And after the meeting, we would go and visit our girlfriends. We'd visit the girlfriends of the of the boys who were most senior in the uh, fraternity, and we'd go, and they expected us. We'd go and have cookies and cokes and whatever. And the reason it was so good is that that experience treated. I mean, it, it showed us how to treat girls how to act, what, what manners we ought to have. And uh, it was a real good experience. And then we'd have parties down to Peabody every Christmas and then maybe in the summertime dance in the same ballroom that's still there now. Was this fraternity at a public school? Oh yeah, Central High, where I attended Central High during my high school years, after I went to Fairview Junior High. Before that, I went to <laughs> I went to Miss Lee's School of Childhood through grade six. It was very selective. My graduating class at Miss Lee's School of Childhood was about six or seven people. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have girls at Miss Lee's School of Childhood? Oh yeah. All right. We did. Yeah, and I remember Jocelyn Plough was in our class. Is that Abe Plough's widow? That, that's Abe, that's Abe Plough's uh, daughter. I see. And uh, Abe Plough of Sharing Plough exactly. and, and the Plough Foundation. Exactly. And then a girl named Natalie Herzberg uh, was also in our class. I can't remember any of the other girls, but... They were both there. I think I think Jocelyn's still living. Well, Natalie has died. During your high school fraternity days, were you dating, or would you just have parties and girls? Oh no, we were we were all dating. Okay. We were all dating, and when we started driving, oh, that was great. That was <laughs> How like old did being, you have to be to drive? That was a car. being let out of <laughs> let out of school, you know. <laughs> How old did you have to be to drive a car? I think he was 16. Did you I, have a car? My, I didn't have a car, but my parents, of course, did. And my mother taught me how to drive. Uh, but, yeah, it was... I was just absolutely blessed with my growing up years. How did you choose a college? Well... Again, my mother was an influence. She encouraged me to think about the three Ivy League schools, Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. Uh, there were two Memphians who were then in Princeton, George Livermore and uh, one other person whose name I forget. Livermore was, I think, got out before I got there. Anyway, I, I made application for all three and was admitted to, uh, to Princeton and went up there with my friend Wesley Goyer, another member of Troop 34. I had forgotten to, to uh, mention him. He was a great person. And as a matter of fact, he became an architect uh, at Princeton and went down to Dallas and Fort Worth and was in charge of the development of the area between Dallas and Fort Worth. He really made a name for himself. He worked for a guy named Zeckendorf, who was a great architect up in New York. I want to make sure that you tell the story about going to find out if you got in Princeton. I know the story begins by you going with your cousins to the World's Fair, is that right? That's correct, in 1939. So you go to the World's Fair in New York, is that right? In New York. All right. The four of us went up together. George Phillips, one of the assistant 
scoutmasters, who incidentally married my first cousin, Catherine Aiken. But George Phillips and Billy and John Phillips, no relation between the two of them and George, and I decided we'd like to go to the World's Fair in New York, which we did. We drove up, parked the car in Trenton, which is only about uh, 50 miles south <coughs> of New York. <coughs> we were up there a couple of weeks, stayed at the YMCA for $50, not $50, 50 cents a night. Can you believe that? I can't. It was right in the middle of the Depression, 1939. We were just beginning to get out of it, but we were still in it. Uh, so we started home. We came on the train from New York to Trenton. And I said, wait a minute, we've got to get off at uh, Princeton Junction, which is about two or three miles from Princeton. Uh, I need to see if I got in. They didn't tell us then, as early as they do now. This was uh, in June. So I went to Nassau Hall, where the admissions office was located. <clears throat> Nobody around because it was summer. No summer school. So I went up the steps to, uh, to the office of the admissions director or secretary. and. Uh, so I walked in. I said, excuse me, but I'd like to find out if I got in for next uh, fall. She looked at me and... Was she friendly? No. Very gruff. She said, wait a minute. <laughs> and she went in the next room. First of all, she asked me, what's your name? I said, Newton Allen. She said, wait a minute. Went in the next room, came back. Southpuss said, you didn't make it. So I said, well, I'm not surprised. <laughs> and I started out. As I got to the door, she said, hold on. What's your middle name? I said, Perkins. Newton Perkins Allen. She said, wait a minute. Went back. This time she came back all smiles. She said, well, you made it. I said, really? I'm I'm delighted, but uh, what's the mix-up with names? She says, well, you won't believe this, but there's another applicant whose name is almost like yours. His name is Walter Newton Allen. I said, well, I'm sorry about him, but I'm glad I made it. I left. That was the first time I was ever in Princeton. The last time I was officially in Princeton was at the prom. The at senior point, prom four years later? Four years, well, three, it was years three and a half years later because I graduated in January mm -hmm. of 43 because of the war. But anyway, I was then down in uh, University of Virginia Law School. I said, well, I've just got to go back to this prom. So I got on the train, went up, and I was at the prom, and I saw this uh, beautiful blonde girl, just gorgeous. I said to myself, I have got to dance with that girl. So I went in, broke, broke in, introduced myself. She says, what's your name? And I told her. She says, isn't that a coincidence? She says, I have a brother whose name is almost like yours. <laughs> and I said, I bet it's Walter Newton Allen. She said, how did you know? <laughs> so I told her the story. We got a big laugh out of, out of it. But I never saw her again. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever find out where poor Walter went to school? Well, I thought he went to Yale. I don't know whether she told me that. I got the information somehow, but I was wrong. Anyway, I told the story to several alumni from Yale because I wanted to sort of get the better of them that I'd gotten in 
and that Yale had been Walter's <laughs> second choice. <laughs> That's exactly right. Well, I was wrong because I later found out, I think he went to Brown. And he had a twin brother who did get admitted to Princeton. What was it like to be at Princeton during that time? Was there a lot of uh, focus on the war and the oh, position? Yeah. yeah, you see the war. When I went to Princeton, which, uh, I think it was September the 13th of, 19, uh, of 1939, and I think Hitler invaded Poland. I believe on uh, September 1, 39. So all of my college years were during the war. And as we got further and further along, there was all there was discussion always about what was happening in Europe, who was invading whom, who was winning. And I was of the opinion after Germany and Russia were antagonists of letting them fight it out. Why should we get involved? But then along came Pearl Harbor. And whereas there had been all sorts of opinions about whether we should get in and stay out after Pearl Harbor, no further discussion. Everybody said, we've got to get in. We've got to get in the war which, of course, we did. Where were you when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Well, I had been down to uh, the lake. Oh, my, what's the name of that lake where the crew rose? It's named after a very famous uh, family. At, at Princeton? At Princeton. I had my shotgun because I like to shoot skeet. And I'd been down to the lake shooting skeet and was riding the uh, train, which was the same train I took when I first got there, back up to the college. And the news came that Pearl Harbor had happened that very morning. I guess it was that morning. Of course, the time changes. Anyway, that's when I found out. And there were bonfires all over the Princeton campus, which had been set by the students. Uh, I don't think in celebration of anything, probably in mourning, because so many people had been killed at Pearl Harbor. How, much, how far along in college were you by the time that happened? Well, that was in 1941. I graduated in January of 43. So I was in my uh, sophomore year. No, my junior year, because 42 was my senior year. And were there people that left Princeton <laughs> to go straight into the armed services? Yeah. A number of them did. A number of them did. And I remember one particular person who left early. And of course, he was killed in France. Uh, and it was, there were several casualties in our class killed in the war. How did you choose your law school? Well, uh, my uncle, Newton Perkins, my mother's brother, had been to the University of Virginia as an undergraduate. And he was very high on UVA. I think all the alumni of UVA uh, have liked it, loved it. And, uh, and I think he influenced my mother, and my mother influenced me to apply for all three. And, then, as I said, I beat out Walter Newton Allen. <laughs> <laughs> By the time you, you, you graduated from Princeton, I guess you had made the decision to be a lawyer? Well, 
there were two influences. One was a professor named Edwin S. Corwin, C-O-R-W-I-N. He was a constitutional scholar. Um, he taught at Princeton a course in constitutional law. Princeton does not have a law school, but he had a course in constitutional law, and he had written a book called the Constitution and What It Means Today. And you have to have a thesis to graduate from Princeton, undergrad. So I chose as the subject of my thesis Governor Eugene Talmadge of Georgia. He was a flamboyant. Uh, he didn't give a damn about what anybody did. He was going to do what he wanted to do. Got in a lot of trouble, too. But anyway, uh, Corwin was a friend of one of the Georgia Board of Regents who had been fired just out of hand by Talmadge. So when he saw these, uh, this uh, thesis subjects, he liked the idea that my thesis was going to be about Talmadge because his friend living in Georgia had been so mistreated by Talmadge. So he selected my thesis to be an advisor. And I got to know Colin very well. And that experience was one of the highlights of my Princeton years. The other was his constitutional law course. Both of them convinced me. Uh, my thesis experience and his course convinced me that I ought to go to law school. And UVA was close, wasn't very far away. Charlottesville, Virginia's right down the railroad. So after I graduated, that's where I went. Did Talmadge's problems throw a wrench in your thesis plans? They sure did, because uh, he lost his election in 1942. I had been over to uh, Atlanta and had a big conference with him. He brought in all of his uh, cronies. He must have thought I was from some newspaper. Uh, anyway, Talmadge lost his election in 42. I hadn't finished my thesis. I still had a chapter to go. So I went to call and says, uh, Professor, what am I going to do now? Talmadge has lost. He said, oh, don't bother about that. Write your next chapter about what a politician can't do. <laughs> and he loses. So I did that. What he can't get away with. Exactly. Or at least what that one can <laughs> get away with. It's exactly. When Pearl Harbor happened, did they institute a draft? Oh, yeah. And I guess if you were in college, you didn't get drafted, or how well, did that work? Well, in order to stay out of the draft and graduate, I had to get into the reserve, I get in the U.S. Reserve, which I did. That permitted me to graduate in January instead of June. <clears throat> so after I graduated in January, then I went on down to UVA. And you didn't have a problem going on to law school instead of the military? Well, I did. Uh, not a problem. I knew I had to report by March, I think it was March 15th, 43. But I went down to UVA and was able to complete three courses. One was constitutional law, another was contracts, another was torts. And I got credit for those three courses before I reported to the Army. Then I went to the Army, was in for 35 months before I got back, and then went back to UVA. Where were you stationed? Well, I went to uh, Fort Sill. It's an artillery school. And some of my roommates, I had three, two of my roommates, well, they also 
because they were in, they had been in the ROTC. When you went from the ROTC in college, then you went to officer's training school. But I didn't like ROTC. I said when I was in Central High, I will never, <laughs> I will never be a part <laughs> of the ROTC. Of course, I was completely wrong. So I was sent to Fort Sill Artillery. I didn't do worth a damn. <laughs> My ears couldn't stand all that noise. And uh, I was not able to get into uh, officer's uh, training school, OCS they called it. But there was another program called the, uh, the uh, Training School for Languages. So I got involved in that and went from Fort Sill up to uh, New York State, about 90 miles north of New York, to a place called Bard College, B-A-R-D. Bard College was later bought by Columbia. It was not then. And I was in a French class with uh, 100 students who had had some French and 100 engineers, 200 people. And at the end of that class, they came around, the Army did, to find out whether we had learned anything. <laughs> <laughs> so my roommate named Lewis Allen, he was the only French student who was taken to get into the intelligence school. The rest of us was sent back to Missouri. <laughs> Now, that's not the Lewis Allen that was a Memphis lawyer, was it? No. Different Lewis Allen. Yeah, completely different. He lived in California, and I connected up with him again after the war. But anyway, that's another story. Did you feel like the, the legal education that you got at Virginia prepared you to be a lawyer? Oh, yeah, it was great. I loved, I loved UVA Law School. Do you yeah. still go back there for reunions? Well, you know, I haven't. You go back to Princeton? I've been back to Princeton many times for reunions. What was your last reunion? Last reunion was my uh, 60, uh, I guess it was my 65th. And in 08, I'm not sure. See, my math is still not worth a damn. <laughs> but anyway, in 08, we'll have a, another big I say big reunion. We have a big reunion every five years. You can go all of times, but on the fifth year, it's a big deal. So I've been back lots of times. And you have a son that went there as well. He did. He graduated in, uh, I think, 1948. Right. Cannon, Cannon Fairfax Allen all right. with Armstrong Allen. And tell me the names of your other children. Well, my first son was John Lobdell Allen. My second uh, daughter, my first daughter, is your wife, Melinda Nobles Allen Lewis. My third child was Newton Allen, Jr., who's a doctor. And my fourth is Cannon. So you have a son-in-law that's a lawyer, and a son that's a lawyer, and a daughter that's a paralegal. Are there any other legal types in the family? Well, yes. After my first wife, Linda, died of cancer in 86, um, four years, almost four years later, I married her, her first cousin, who is also named Melinda. We've got a bunch of Melinda's. And she got her law degree from University of Memphis in 1999. And her father was, uh, was one of the founders of one of the biggest law firms in North Carolina, Kennedy, Covington, Lobdell, and Hickman. He, he's now dead. Her mother is still living in Charlotte. And she graduated 
1999. I, I think on, she graduated Order of the Coif at University of Memphis and went on to clerk for Judge Alan Glenn on the Court of Criminal Appeals. That's right, and she she worked there until my partner, Alec Dan, he and I became partners after I left Armstrong Allen in 95, um, after he died. Uh, she and I teamed up together, and we now practice together. It's a, it's a two-firm solo practice. <laughs> Who's the boss? She is. <laughs> Good answer. You know, the, you know the answer to that. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> now tell us the names. I hate to put you on the spot because there are a lot of them. But oh, and there's one more lawyer okay. in the family. That's my brother Dick's son, Rick Allen. Right. And he was with Armstrong Allen for a while, and he left and formed his own firm. And he's, he's practicing and doing very well. Right. I saw him at lunch today. <clears throat> now, this, this, this is really probably not a fair question, but can you name all your grandchildren? <laughs> Why don't we start with how many of them are there? <laughs> oh, there are eight. There are eight. I can name them all, but the trouble I have is remembering birthdays of each one of them. I simply can't. Melinda puts them up on a calendar. That's the only way I can keep track. Well, uh, the oldest one is Newton Jr.'s daughter, Sarah. And she's expressed an interest in being a lawyer. Yes, and she's won in several competitions uh, while, she was, uh, while she was in high school. She was on the mock trial team that won the state mock trial competition when she was a senior. And do you remember the name of the high school in Nashville? Um, well, if you give me about an hour, <laughs> it'll come to me. Okay. She is now at Davidson College in North Carolina, okay. where Newton went and where Berkeley, his wife, went. And she loves it. And the other grandchildren? Well, Newton the third uh, follows her. He's still in high school. <coughs> he's... Uh, I think he's a mathematical genius. I don't know where he gets it. I guess he gets it from his mother, Berkeley, because she's an engineer, as smart as she can be. Wonderful. Uh, then there's uh, Mary, and she's still in school in uh, Nashville. Delightful person. And then you get to Cannon's children, Catherine. She'll be a senior in high school next fall. <coughs> followed by Emily, and then Cannon Jr., and then another Melinda. And then my son John Allen, uh, who's divorced from his wife, uh, his son John and his mother live in um, Georgia, Brunswick, Georgia. I think Sarah's mock trial team that won the state was from Hume Fogg High School. Is that right? You're right. All right. I don't have to remember it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I couldn't remember it for a minute or two myself. I got some help. We've been going about an hour, Newton Allen. Why don't we take a break and we'll come back and talk about your early experiences as a lawyer. Fine. All right, so we've, we've talked about um, law school. After law school, did you know that you want to come back to Memphis, or was that another big decision to be made? Oh, no, I, there was no question. I wanted to come back to Memphis. Uh -huh. But I made, a, I made a big mistake because uh, Judge uh, Martin Sr. John Martin? On the, John Martin, who was on the Sixth Circuit, Court of Appeals, great friend of my dad's. Um, asked me to come up there and clerk. Like an idiot, I said, no. I want to go back to Memphis and start practicing. That was a terrible mistake. Do you remember why you were in such a hurry to start with private I practice? I have no idea. I have no idea. Uh, of course, I was married at the time. I married Linda in 1947. 
before my senior year at UVA. But that wasn't the reason, because my dad and Dr. Noble's her father were helping support me anyway. <laughs> my starting salary at Armstrong Allen, or the predecessor, predecessor was only $150 a month. I'm sure I would have been paid more if I had judged, if I had clerked for uh, Judge Martin, but that was not the idea. I missed a good opportunity. It was a dumb, it was a dumb move. If I remember correctly, mm -hmm. you met your first wife, Linda, through another Memphis lawyer. That's correct. Tell us about that. Well, George Mara and his wife, Ruth Thickman Mara, George was in uh, UVA same time I was. He was, uh, I think, maybe three months behind me. After the war, they didn't do it on the regular schedule. We went three months, and then three months, and then three months. We had to take a break at some time. But George was uh, behind me. And uh, George and Ruth had, uh, after exams, were going to have dinner at their apartment. And uh, another student named Bill Murphy was invited by them to come. But he had an opportunity to go to Washington to observe the Supreme Court. So he took off. And as a pinch hitter, they asked me <laughs> to come to dinner. And they had asked Linda to come down from New York where she was working after having graduated from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, uh, to come to dinner. So that's where I met her, through George and Ruth Mara, bless their hearts. And did you hit it off from the start? Absolutely. But you know what? I went to sleep. I was so tired. <laughs> I was so tired from all those exams, and their apartment was hot. And the, and the big heater sitting up in the corner. And uh, anyway, I went to sleep during the, uh, during the evening. But we hit it all fine, especially the next day after I woke up. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't seem to mind that you'd fallen asleep. <laughs> no. Did you snore in the middle of dinner? <laughs> uh, that, was, that came later. <laughs> <laughs> And did the four of you remain friends for a long time? Oh, yeah. Uh, George and Ruth and Linda and myself were, were good friends forever. I understand that you <laughs> represented George in one legal matter. Well, the first, the first legal matter that I had in Memphis uh, was to get George a middle initial. He did not have one. And he went through the Army. George, no middle initial, Mara. And he got so sick and tired of it. He said, I want you to go down to probate court and get me a middle initial. I said, fine. Uh, what's, what's the name? What name do you want to choose? He thought and said, well, how about Everett? I like Everett. So it became George E. Mara ever since. Tell me about... Uh what it was like to come back and go to work for your dad's law firm. Nowadays, they have these rules about people joining a family law firm. Was that something that was a problem then, or was it encouraged for sons and daughters to go to work for family law firms? It was not a problem. As a matter of fact, Walt Armstrong, Jr., uh, after the war, came back a little bit before I did because his father was one of the founders. So was my dad. So it wasn't a problem. <clears throat> what type of work did you do at first? Oh, nothing. The first thing I, the first thing I did besides getting George Morrow middle initial <laughs> was to adjust insurance claims. Can you imagine? Nothing any more boring and any more uninspiring than to adjust insurance claims. 
which uh, uh, I did for, I guess, a year. Did you ever think you'd pick the wrong profession? <laughs> At that point, I was sure. <laughs> no, I thought there must be more. There must be more than adjusting insurance claims. How did you charge for legal services? Well, we didn't charge in those days on the hour. We charged per uh, unit of work. Uh, if it was a complaint or an answer or a motion outside of adjustment, we'd charge so much for drawing a complaint or an answer, so much for trial. Well, there were three days of trial. We figured out how much that would be and then bill the client. It was not until much later that we started billing by the hour. Was it the firm's idea to bill by the hour? Well, I think at that point our clients and most clients liked very much by, uh, billing by the hour because they could see on their invoice exactly what you did, and then how much time you spent, and the figure. They liked it. I'm sure they don't like it now, because it's gotten to be a curse as well as a blessing, in my opinion. But do you, do you when, think, excuse me, go ahead. When we started charging by the hour, the income of our firm just went <laughs> through the roof. We loved it because we were defense. We were mostly defense counsel, uh, not, not plaintiffs. As a matter of fact, there were very few plaintiff cases that our firm handled with contingent fees. But we bill by the hour to these insurance companies or to any other client has money on the table. Did the lawyers work harder with the advent of billable hours? Oh, yeah. They worked harder and they still do today. I think too hard. I think they need a break. And I think the clients need a break. So when billable hours came in, the result was bigger fees and longer hours for lawyers. Exactly. Did you ever have any clients come back and say, never mind the billable hours, go back to the way you were billing before? No. <laughs> Now, we wouldn't have done it, <laughs> but we were never asked. Now, you didn't adjust claims your whole career. Did you, oh, no. <laughs> did you begin to, to get bigger and better cases? Oh, yeah, sure. Tell us about some of your most memorable ones. Well, a number of years back, we represented CBS. And as I recall, uh, Stacks Records was involved because CBS had loaned Stacks for about six million dollars. And uh, Stacks, I think, went bankrupt. In any event, CBS wasn't being paid its money. So we represented, we represented them. And, uh, and one of their anchors uh, and you can tell me his name because your, your memory is so much better than mine. I uh, came down to Memphis. Uh, no, that was another case. That was another case for, for CBS. But anyway, we, we did represent, uh, we represented CBS and we finally settled the case. Did you, uh, I understand that you did some work involving a very famous old song. Yeah, that's true. And this grew out of that litigation with uh, Stax and CBS. As I recall, Neil Diamond and Barbara Streisand had both recorded the song named You Don't Bring Me Flowers Anymore. Uh, separate songs, separate albums. Then 
CBS made that song into one recording. And uh, it was claimed that this, they had stolen the records of uh, Diamond and Streisand. So there was litigation about it. So during that litigation, uh, which was also settled, I took the deposition of Neil Diamond. I couldn't get Barbara Streisand to make a deposition. <laughs> And uh, so that was one of the memorable law matters that I was involved with. I think the other case that you're talking about involved Dan Rather. That's true. The anchor, Dan Rather. And I understand he came to Memphis. And why, did, why were you representing Dan Rather, and what was he here for? Well... His, uh, his broadcasting outfit wanted to get uh, munitions tests on the rifle that had shot Martin Luther King. Because, as I recall, there had never been any kind of test on the rifle to be sure that the bullet came from that rifle. So anyway, they wanted to, to have that test made. So I represented them. I went before Slick Williams. You remember Slick? <laughs> I went before Slick Williams. So our audience will know that's Judge Slick Williams. <laughs> he later, he later it, became a judge. And his real name wasn't Slick. <laughs> no. Was it William Williams? William, yeah. Okay. Anyway, everybody called him. Oh, I, you're right. You're not the only one calling him Slick. Everybody knew him as Judge Slick Williams. Yeah. So anyway, uh, he turned me down. Was he a criminal court judge? Must have been. Must have been. Because I went in to ask him to allow this to happen, and he said no. So then I appealed the case, went up to Supreme Court directly, not before the Court of Appeals. And Judge Phones was then on the Supreme Court bench. And the Supreme Court also turned me down. Well, as a result of all this, Dan Rather came to Memphis. Uh, I don't know whether it was during the litigation or after, but he and another member of his outfit came down to Memphis. And I took them to Justine's restaurant. Uh, old Justine's, which is now defunct. On East Street off of Crump. Exactly. So uh, my brother Dick and his wife, <clears throat> Minnie Lee, uh, and Linda and I, and probably somebody else, all took Dan Rather and his cohort to uh, Justine's for dinner. And we had a nice dinner and a nice conversation. We were, of course, in the back room for privacy. And then as we walked out of, the, uh, of Justine's, uh, some guy at a table, as my brother Dick went by, he pulled on, his, on Dick's sleeve and says, says I know, uh, I know uh, the anchor man, but who are you? <laughs> 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 looked straight at him and said, I'll never tell. <laughs> and then he walked right on out. <laughs> now, would you call yourself then a litigator or did you call yourself a trial lawyer? We never called ourselves litigators. We called ourselves trial lawyers. And that's the way you see yourself today? Well, yes, and I, I'm not retired. And I still try cases. And Emmett Braden, who was one of the greatest defense lawyers, I think, in Tennessee and perhaps in the whole country. Partner in your firm. Partner of my, in my firm. And he was my mentor. And he would take, get me involved in the case, and we'd go down and try it. 
Uh, he was a marvelous person. He lived in the Peabody Hotel. He came from, uh, I think it was Henderson, Tennessee. And the story was that he had asked a young lady to marry him. And she had turned him down. He never got married. He moved to Memphis, lived in the Peabody Hotel, single room. And bless his heart, on the table right next to his chair was a bottle of bourbon. But he was never inebriated, much less drunk, in court, or at any time that I ever knew him. He was always a competent, accomplished defense lawyer. Now, I understand that uh, one of the, the new things that you brought to your firm was the copy machine. Tell us about that. Well, that's right. When I started out, of course, everything was typewriters. I had a great secretary who could type anything. She was absolutely a genius. But copy machines came into style. And uh, so I thought we ought to have one. We did not. And I went over to Charlotte, and I, take, I talked to Hugh Lobdell. Hugh Lobdell is the father of my second wife, Melinda, your wife. I mean, uh, <laughs> see, I'm getting Melinda's mixed up. I know the feeling. My wife. <laughs> my, <laughs> my wife. Anyway, Hugh was... Uh, uh, a fine lawyer over in Charlotte, and they had uh, they had these uh, copy machines. They were on a, a round disc, and they rolled around and recorded what you said, and then you could press a button, and it would all be typed out. So I took that idea back to our firm, and I, I think our firm was one of the first firms, or maybe the first, that had them. Well, now, are you talking about a copy machine or a dictaphone? I'm talking about really a dictaphone. You're right. Not copy machines. Dictaphone. You, you remember about when that was? Oh, it was a long time ago. Because Hugh, of course, Hugh was still living. He was still practicing. Oh, I don't know, 40 years ago, maybe well, 45. What was the, the, the Memphis bar like? back then. For example, was it all white men? It was, uh, with very few exceptions. Was it good collegiality? I think it was more collegial than, uh, a lot more than it was now, is now. And they were mostly white men. There were, I think, a, a couple of lawyers who were black. And there were only two women. Catherine Watson of our firm, who practiced in probate, and then another another woman whose specialty was divorce. All she handled was divorce. Very undiversified bar. How did you end up having one of the few women lawyers in your firm? She had been there for years. Catherine Watson had been there for years. And I remember when my time came to be a partner, she spoke to me and says, do you really want to be a partner? <laughs> I said, well, of course. Of course I want to be a partner. She said, well, you ought not to do it. I said, why? She said, well, you know, partners are liable. Partners are liable for the debts of the firm. You shouldn't get into that. I didn't pay any attention. <laughs> <laughs> Was Memphis uh, an interesting place to be in the middle of the civil rights movement? How oh, did that affect your day-to-day -day work and life? Very much, because at that time, uh, the blacks, the African-Americans, were segregated. 
They couldn't go in and eat at a restaurant. They couldn't stay at a hotel. They couldn't drink from the same water fountain as white people. They were segregated completely. The only way uh, an African American could get into a hotel would be that if she was a nurse for some somebody in the family uh, and was traveling with them, then she could stay with the family in a hotel. But otherwise, they couldn't. And looking back on it, I just can't imagine how all that had come about because the change has been tremendous and a very good change. And as a matter of fact, when Henry Loeb was mayor, uh, the uh, sanitation workers went on strike. And uh, Judge Alice Andradas, I think, was on the Chancery bench. And he decided, uh, I think he was, I think he was on the bench. Anyway, the chancellor, whoever he was, decided against the uh, Tennessee statute that uh, public employees couldn't strike. Well, they struck anyway, uh, and, and he upheld their right to strike. And of course, all down Main Street were all the uh, black sanitation workers carrying signs uh, saying, I am a man. Because everybody used to call blacks as grown people. They'd call them as boys. Hey, boy, come do this. Hey, boy, come do that. And then, of course, Martin Luther King came to Memphis. When was it? 63, 67, whatever. I think it was shot. Judge Bailey Brown that allowed them to, to uh, march. Is that right? I'd forgotten that. Um, when Dr. King was shot, what, what was the reaction of, especially the legal community at that time? Everybody was uh, shocked. Everybody. Uh, nobody had expected anything like that to happen, especially growing out of a sanitation strike. Here, Dr. King came down to support them, was shot, killed. Uh, I think the whole legal community was, uh, was aghast that that had happened. And as a matter of fact, I believe, I'm not sure this is correct, but you know the organization MIFA, M-I-F-A? I think MIFA was begun uh, at that time as a result of King's assassination. I think MIFA stands for Memphis Interfaith Association. That's correct. Well, did, did this, the death of Dr. King and the sanitation strike and the events after the death of Dr. King lead to a more prominent role for African-American lawyers in the bar and in the judiciary? Well, it, it, it did. It did, and I can't cite you any specific examples, but that really was a turning point in the legal profession here in Memphis, and I expect elsewhere in the country. <clears throat> What was the influence of the state and local bar association? Did they play a, an important role in the, the life of a lawyer at that time? Well, I think they did. And as I said earlier in this interview uh, today, uh, my brother Dick was very active in the Memphis Bar and uh, And I think the, uh, the events of those times uh, made it very important for the Memphis Bar to be more active. And, uh, and he participated in it very well. Were there uh, judges or lawyers 
that you particularly looked up to or particularly enjoyed listening to or, or working with? There were indeed. There were four circuit judges when I started practicing. It was Andy Holmes, John Wilson, Harry Adams, and uh, Henderson. I forget Henderson's first name. Anyway, uh, there were only four. They were all competent, educated, fair, really good judges. And I looked up to all of them, uh, especially Harry Adams and Judge Adams. I mean, Harry, uh, Harry Adams and John Wilson. I had a lot of cases in John Wilson's court and some in uh, Judge Adams. Many lawyers these days talk about how they can't wait to retire. And you've already told us that uh, you're in your 80s and you hadn't retired. And I get the impression you don't intend to retire. I don't want to. And I don't intend to. And tell us what your philosophy is about that. Well, on January 3, I, was, I became 84 years old. I left Armstrong Island at the end of 95 because I thought that 47 and a half years with that firm was sufficient. <laughs> and another thing, I did not like the idea of billable hours. Uh, so anyway, I, I left the firm on good terms and started practicing with my friend Alec Dan. Alec and I played tennis. Uh, he was a really good lawyer and a real good friend. He died several years back, and then I began to practice with my wife. But as far as retirement is concerned, I don't want to do it because I think, for me, I want to be active and I want to be useful to the extent that I can be useful. I'm sure that I'm not always useful. I've lost a lot of cases, as well as some I've won. But retirement, I think, means being idle. A lot of people say, oh, they find things to do. But I also hear a lot about people retiring and, and becoming idle. And I think if I retired, I'd probably be dead in six months. <laughs> and I don't want to do that. What, what types of cases um, interest you at this point in your career? What type of cases are you working on? Well, most of my practice is in probate, but not all of it. Uh, I'm involved with the workman's comp, worker's comp case now, and I almost daily uh, would like to cuss out my opponents, but refrain from doing so sometimes. Uh, I also like personal injury cases, whether it's plaintiff or defendant. So, Are you handling pro bono cases now that you couldn't well, have done when you were at the firm? I'm not handling pro bono cases as such. I'm handling cases which I don't get paid much, and sometimes <laughs> very, very little or not at all. But it's not pro bono as such. My wife is doing some pro bono, but I'm not. I'm working for fees and sometimes don't get paid. <laughs> sometimes it's pro bono you didn't know it was pro bono. <laughs> That's right. Well, you mentioned wanting to cuss out your opponents, but not doing so. <laughs> Um, has, has professional courtesy changed since you have been a lawyer? Has it changed for the better or changed for the worse? Well, I think it's changed probably for the worse. But there were a couple of lawyers in my early uh, practicing years who were real uh, mean people. 
I wouldn't name any names, and I'm afraid I can't remember the names anyway. But whenever you got involved with one of these guys, professional courtesy went right out the window. But I think generally, professional courtesy was a lot better. Why do you think that is? I'm not sure. I think it may be size. Uh, there are a lot more lawyers than now than there were then. Uh, and I, th I, I really think, too, that charging by the hour, I think that's made a difference. And let's go back. You've talked about your wife doing pro bono, and you've mentioned your wife. Let's go back to the time you lost your first wife. What year was that? 1986 in November. And about the time that I met my wife, you were in your bachelor years. That's true. <laughs> and what was it like to be a bachelor? How old were you then, in your 60s? Well, let's see. I, I, I married Melinda in... Uh, June of uh, of ninety. Um, Linda had died in eighty six. I was at that point. Uh, how old was I? As I was in my sixties. What was it like to be in your sixties and be a bachelor and be dating again? Well, as a matter of fact, it was fun. And I dated people that I uh, liked and respected, and still do. And they are still my friends. But even though you dated ladies here in Memphis, you didn't marry a Memphis girl, did you? No, she was from Charlotte. She was at that time working in Winston-Salem because she had, she had divorced her husband. And she had, she's got two children, both of them excellent people. How did you meet? Melinda. Well, that goes back a long way because Linda and I used to, uh, since we were relatives, we used to visit in Charlotte from time to time. And before I got married to Melinda in 90, somebody asked me, how long you, have you known this girl you're going to marry? I said, uh, since she was seven years old. <laughs> <laughs> Just telling the truth, weren't you? That's exactly right. And, and of course, we had uh, visited with Hugh and Mary Blodwell many times, and Melinda and her older daughter, older sister, Anne, had come down to Rosedale, Mississippi. Rosedale was where Linda was born, and also Melinda was born, my wife was born there during the war because Hugh Lobner was off in the war. How did you reconnect with her? Well, there was a wedding up in uh, Richmond, Virginia of some relatives of uh, Melinda. So I thought it was a good idea. I knew these, I knew these people also. Uh, so I thought it was a good idea to drive up to Richmond. So I took uh, a young couple with a, a small child up to Richmond. And of course, Melinda and her mother, and I think Ann was probably there, that's her sister, Melinda's sister. So we reconnected at that wedding. And as uh, soon as we did, I figured, well, this is the gal I've got to marry. When you got married to Melinda, you were a Republican. Staunchly. Are you still a Republican? No. <laughs> when you got married to Melinda, she was a Democrat. Yes, she was. Is she still a Democrat? She <laughs> sure is. How then did it happen that you're now a Democrat <laughs> instead of being a Republican? <laughs> well, well, a lot of people, and maybe you are among them, a lot of people <laughs> say that, that Melinda influenced me to become a Democrat, but that's not so. Uh, the, the Republicans, uh, who I supported for years, 
first Republican I, I mean, first, first time I voted in a presidential election was for Wilkie against Roosevelt. So long ago, I can't even remember. Uh, and I worked in Eisenhower's campaign uh, all through that campaign. Uh, but the Republicans have left me behind. And uh, I think that uh, President Bush, and I won't get into my uh, political uh, thoughts, except to say that I think President Bush is one of the worst presidents we've ever had, be that as it may. And I write letters to the editor, but they never publish them. <laughs> well, they publish <laughs> one every now and then. Oh, well, they did once. <laughs> They'd have to char char start charging you for the space there in the paper if they published every one. <clears throat> Let's talk about the rule of law and the American judicial system. Why do you think the rule of law in our country is so important? Well, I think it's essential. It's not important, it's essential. Of course, we live in a democracy. And that's the first thing I think that the rule of law has come out of. We have a balance of powers, a legislature, an executive, and an independent, and I stress the word independent, judiciary. We have a constitution, which is not something that is uh, just a legal document that just sits there. Uh, it's been amended numerous times by the people. It guarantees freedom of speech, which is absolutely essential to the rule of law. It guarantees freedom of religion, again, an essential requisite of the rule of law. Trial by jury in criminal cases, and in many cases, civil cases, trial by jury either unanimously or majority. All of these things, I think, are an essential part of the rule of law. If we can't criticize any person who's in office or any candidate for office, if we can't criticize with freedom of speech, uh, the rule of law would I think, cease to exist. So I think that the American system, which has produced what we call the rule of law for, for this country, is absolutely essential to this country. It protects the citizens of this country. We have trials and trial courts, but we have the right of appeal. We have Nexus Lexus coming across our desk weekly with appellate opinions, some of which overrule the trial courts, some of which affirm. And we have a Supreme Court, which, with permission, didn't used to be this way, but with permission, can take cases and do the same thing. So we have a system which is not perfect, but which is designed to correct errors. Why do you think the existence of the appellate courts is so critical? Well, just as I've uh, just said, uh, trial judges, trial jurors frequently make errors which need to be corrected. And if we don't have appellate courts, there's no way for those errors to be corrected. If we didn't have appellate courts, I think we'd have chaos 
and anarchy. Absolutely essential. You've been active in the American Bar Association Seniors Division. The Senior Lawyers Division. And in fact, you've served as uh, president of that group, is that correct? Well, it's called the chair. The chair of that, of that group, uh, 98, uh, 98, 99, one year. And I'm just curious, do you think that the talent and wisdom and energy of senior lawyers is, is uh, wasted and that that, that that wisdom and talent could be put to better use? Well, I think the talent and experience of senior lawyers is very important. And I think the senior lawyers division of the American Bar, uh, it's a good division, and I think it produces uh, a magazine, produces a senior lawyer's letter, which is distributed to all of the members of the, of the group which has a good influence. However, having said that, I think that there is some waste of the experience of senior lawyers. We go to council meetings four times a year, twice with the ABA, and then it's also in the fall and, and in the spring. The only people who attend, by and large, are council members and committee members. There are some other people that come because it's in their own city. We could do with a lot more participation by all of the senior lawyers. And in that respect, some of the, uh, some of the good that the senior lawyers do is not being used uh, most efficiently. You think senior lawyers would respond if asked to do pro bono or asked to be involved in the bar um, that that they they'd like to be because they involved and become involved and just need to be asked well we have a very good group of people in the senior lawyers division who do pro bono work uh, Mary Pat Toops out in California sort of heads up that effort and we give awards to people every year in the division who have done pro bono work. So in that sense, a lot of good is being done by that division. We talked about uh, some of the judges that you admired as circuit judges when you first started practicing. And I'm just curious, to, what is it that you think, uh, what are the qualities of a good judge? What makes a good judge, trial or appellate? Well, I think one of the things that's most important, of course, is fairness and competence. They've got to be fair. They've got to be competent. They've got to look at the cases they decide or administer if they're jury cases fairly and competently. Another requisite is that they be prompt in making their decisions. I think there's nothing worse than a judge, trial judge, who puts off a making a decision. My father had a case down in Mississippi. He represented national distillers in some sort of dispute. The judge down there took it under advisement for 13 13 years, 13 years. By the time he was promoted, and I certainly don't want to, I can't even remember his name. If I remembered it, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> but by the time he was promoted to the Supreme Court of Mississippi, all the lawyers had died. My father hadn't died. Those who had not died were afraid to call it to his attention because they thought he might decide against them. Anyway, that's an extreme example. That's a bad example, but an extreme one. <laughs> How would you like to be remembered? Well, 
Uh, my father lived to be 84. He didn't practice law for about 14 years because he had what was called a hematoma, which was a blood uh, clot. It was a big clot between the brain covering and the skull, which had to be removed. And then he had uh, prostate cancer. Um, as a result of his illness, he couldn't practice for 14 years. But he was a great chancery, particularly chancery lawyer. And of course, your father was a great chancellor. But anyway, uh, during the TBA fundraising, I got together with Ben Adams, your, I think your managing partner in your firm, uh, and suggested that uh, his mother, who was Tempe Kaiser, Bill Kaiser's daughter, my former father's law partner, that we dedicate the uh, room up in uh, Nashville, in the TVA, for depositions and mediation, which we did. In the memory of? In memory of my father and Mr. Kaiser, mm -hmm. William D. Kaiser, K-Y-S-E-R, Tempe's father, and Ben Adams' grandfather. I don't want to be remembered that way. <laughs> I don't want to be remembered that way, but the reason, the, the way that I would like to be remembered is uh, as a lawyer who did the best he could, not perfectly by all means, but the best he could do uh, for the time that he practiced law. So. Maybe that answers your question. Your daughter tells me that you're a wonderful piano player. Oh, I haven't played the piano in so long. I used to be a pretty good piano player in my growing up years. An interesting story, I took, uh, I took uh, piano lessons from a Mr. Chazzo who taught at the uh, Miss Lee's School of Childhood. But she taught classical music. I didn't like that. You liked Boogie Woogie. <laughs> no. That's not Boogie what Woogie. I hear. Boogie Woogie came in later. But anyway, I told my mother, I said, look, I don't want to stay in Mr. Chazzo's uh, uh, class. It wasn't a class. I don't want to stay with her. Find me somebody else that can teach me popular music. So she took me over to a guy named Clark Tate at uh, Cleveland and Madison, I think, on the second floor. He had a sign out that said, 30 lessons, $30, guaranteed to play. <laughs> So I took, and he lived up to it. I, he did. I took 30 lessons, which my parents paid for 30 bucks, and I could play. But I couldn't play the bass clef. I've never been able to play the, the bottom part of the music. I played the top clef, the treble clef, and I used the chords up at the top, F, C, G, so forth, put them together. But I haven't played in so long. I tried to play the other day, and I almost uh, decided that I would retire. And I said, you don't. <laughs> well, for your devotion to family and your devotion to the profession and your love of music and the arts and for this wonderful afternoon that you spent with us, we are grateful, Newton Allen, <laughs> and we thank you for the time you've spent with us today. Well, I thank you very much for the, uh, for the honor of doing it and the pleasure because I've enjoyed it and I hope that I haven't uh, fallen uh, too far below the line. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you.